Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for another one of the lectures in our uh, 2018 series here. For it's been uh, co-sponsored by the Friends of the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge and the Parker River Refuge itself. My name is Ted Olson, and uh, really great to see people here again. I see a lot of familiar faces too. So thank you very much for uh, continuing to support our event. Uh, tonight we have another uh, lecture by our historian Mary Ellen LaBianca, again on North American Indians and, uh, and the uh, people that inhabited the Parker River area. So, more to do. I welcome you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a new presentation, uh, so if you were here for the others, um, there are some new things, new slides. Uh, but you've seen this uh, cover slide before. Uh, it's a uh, reconstruction of a middle woodland period archaeological site. Uh, and it happens to be on the Merrimack River up in uh, Andover. And it's been, the painting is a representation of actual archaeological finds there, a reconstruction of what the site was like. And that would have been a fairly typical um, Algonquian or late uh, woodland Indian village with a lot of diversity because they were bands of uh, extended families and each family did its own thing. So there was a lot of diversity and variety within each community and the bands were constantly uh, mixing and matching uh, going apart and then coming together uh, at different times of year and so on. Um, I got interested in how the Native Americans who lived here used the natural resources that are here in the Parker River watershed. Uh, and so uh, this presentation is about their material culture. <coughs> that includes all the things that they made for use in daily living, uh, their houses and uh, furnishings, canoes, weapons, tools and equipment, clothing, containers, utensils, and art. And there was a village um, at Indian Hill in West Newbury called Kwaska Quiquen. Uh, the colonists called it uh, Kwaska Quiquen and applied the name to the Parker River. This is a, a 1640 map that shows Kwaska Quiquen preserved as the name of the Parker River. But it was actually a corruption of the name of the village of the Indians who were living there in the area, which was uh, Kwaska Quiquen. <laughs> up at Indian Hill, um, and that translates as um, best place for planting corn. And that is the true name of uh, the true translation of that that name. Uh, the people who lived here are referred to as the Pawtucket. They were Abenaki speaking Eastern Woodland Indians. They were descended from the Penacook of New Hampshire. Um, and they began occupying New England and mixing with the late archaic people who are already living here sometime around 3,500 years ago or so. And the material culture that I'm describing is theirs more so than the people who came before them. People have been living here for off and on for the last 14,000 years. Beginning with stone, these are the natural materials that the Algonquians used to furnish and embellish their lives. They mined many kinds of rocks and minerals. And so my study brought me back to my college courses in geology. Um, I learned that they mined chalcopyrite, pyrite, and galena at Turkey Hill, and at sites called Devil's Basin, Devil's Stevens Pond in North Andover, who may be familiar with some of these uh, sites. Um, uh, these minerals are all forms of lead, and they're often found in association with silver or gold. There is a little silver around here. Um, in fact, there's a silver mine in Rowley, for instance, but not gold. And there is a fair amount of copper. This uh, chalcopyrite is a sulfide of copper and iron, and that is the principal ore of copper. The colonists also exploited these resources at nine known native mines here in Newbury and Newburyport, as well as a copper mine in Topsfield, um, suitably called Copper Mine Road. 
Lead-based ores and minerals are from metamorphosed limestone, which is very common here. Native Americans used the pyrite in fire making. The galena crystals with their square shape were believed to have healing properties. They were a staple in shaman's uh, kits. And if you've seen galena, of course, it is very impressive looking, both pyrite and galena. These are very common here. These are three native mines in Newbury, Devil's Basin, Devil's Den, and Devil's Rock. Any place name with the word devil in it was a Native American site. <coughs> the Algonquins <coughs> practiced sorcery, and the colonists uh, you know, regarded them, uh, persecuted them during the witchcraft uh, hysteria because of that. And, uh, their last refuges often were in rock shelters or old mines, whereupon those places acquired the name of devil, devil's this or devil's that. Um, so the colonists also uh, used these mines. They quarried serpentine rock from these to use in building, and they also used the excavations as lime kilns. Um, and the colonists used the abundant bog iron here for their first ironworks, including the famous ironworks at Saugus. There's tons of bog iron here, if you know what to do with it. The Pawtucket were mining copper in ore in Topsfield. They would pound the ore into uh, flat disks, um, and the disks were used as ornaments or were um, worn as breastplates, as a kind of micro-armor over the throat or over the heart. Um, so warriors wore them, and the graves of warriors often had these copper discs in the graves as a grave good. Uh, the copper mine is here at the Ferncroft Golf Club property in um, Topsfield. John Endicott bought this mine and the surrounding land from Masconomet or Masconominet in 1638. The Topsfield mine also yielded magnetite and malachite, which were prized for their magical properties. Every shaman's medicine bag contained nuggets of these minerals. And magnetite, as the name suggests, is magnetized, which would have attracted any iron barren stone. Uh, so there's all kinds of opportunities for magic there. Uh, quartz was also prized and is ubiquitous here in great variety. The background picture in this slide is uh, blue quartz, a rare blue quartz. Um, it's at Andrews Point in Rockport, and it has been quarried by Native Americans. It has all the signs of their quarrying technique, which was to uh, uh, peck off rock and uh, vertical, vertical strips, vertical adjacent strips. So whenever you see this in a rock, you're probably looking at a native quarrying technique. The uh, Algonquians, the quartz had magical properties. Um, quartz crystals were worn as amulets, carried in medicine bags, and although they were very difficult to work and did not really maintain a sharp edge, they were made into spear points and uh, arrowheads especially for hunting deer. Um, magically, the quartz was believed um, that it would seek out the deer, sort of like guided missiles. Um, okay. In addition to calco pyrite and pyrite and galena, the native mine on Kent's Island, which is right here, isn't it, in your area? It also had bornite, which is a copper-bearing schist, siderite, which is an iron ore, and limonite, calcite, and kaolinite, which are paint stones. Limonite and hematite make red and orange paint. Powdered calcite makes a white pigment, and kaolinite was a chalky filler for paint and also was used in ceramics. Rowley, Middleton, Georgetown, Boxford, Andover, and North Andover are all major sources of these stones, as well as Newbury, West Newbury, and Newburyport. Very common here. Another important paint stone was graphite, which is a form of carbon. It is mined locally in Middleton, 
or the people here imported it from a Nipmuc mine near Sturbridge called Tantusquez. Graphite made blue and black face paint. A band of black across the eyes was a symbol of bereavement. The Algonquians also mined soapstone or steatite, which is plentiful in the Parker River watershed in great variety. All the forms are here blue, gray, green, and black. Um, sex soapstone, is, uh, if you've handled it, is a very soft, very heavy stone. It uh, contains a lot of talc, <coughs> easily carved. Jenkins Quarry in Andover and the Harold Parker State Forest have large amounts of blue soapstone. And the native people also picked soapstone out of the ledges along the Skug River, out of the Nice at Fishbrook, and out of the diorite at Shatner's Pond. These are all here in your area. These pictures show native quarrying on the Skug River in Andover. They would peck V-shaped grooves into the natural seams and fissures to split the rock into blanks, which were then carried off and later made into bowls or other objects. On the bottom picture, I don't know if my, oh it does, does it, yes there, am I seeing right, oh yeah, it's, it's not very clear is it, is there a way to fix the, the um, focus, no, hmm, sorry, sorry about that, I didn't, it's resolution, it's, a re it's the resolution, yes, I don't, I'm not sure how to fix that, but it is too bad. I am sorry. Uh, this is a new thing. But anyway, you can see where a, a blank for a bowl has been carved out of the left side here. And on the right, here's another bowl coming that has been left incompleted. It hasn't been finished. Uh, so you can still find native uh, mining. Um, on the banks of the Skull River and in, in other places. Of course, and if anybody does know how to change the re resolution, I'll be glad to pause. <laughs> um, but these are some of the things uh, from, from found here in this area that were made from soapstone. Pipes and mortars, pestles, bowls, and effigy carvings. The uh, Pawtucket Sitting Black Bear is in the collection of the Peabody Essex Museum. And here are a spindle wall and a plummet. Um, and these are weights for, uh, that were added to spear throwers or atalatics. Um, and steatite was a favorite uh, thing for those. This was um, never hold, so it wasn't used as an atlatl weight and may have been uh, made ceremonially um, because they would have drilled the hole before finishing the exterior just in case the stone broke. You always would. Anything that was going to get a hole or a spark, <coughs> you did that first before you did all this shaping and polishing just to save effort. So I, I, I don't know what the use of that whale, they call it the whale tail. That is in the Cape Ann Museum. Um, the wedge method, the you know, using the uh, hammer with a wedge was used in other types of native quarries, like this one, which is uh, at Red Rocks, in the Red Rocks Conservation Area in West Gloucester, near Mount Ann. Notice that trees are allowed to grow in intervals in the crack. This helps to split the rock. And quite often, the Algonquians would intentionally uh, plant or encourage the growth of plants in cracks in order to help uh, split the rock. And blocks of stone, you can see how they were, it was dragged down. Again, a vertical mining method. And then the blocks were transported to manufacturing sites, or they might be traded to other groups, or they might be uh, cached for future use uh, underground. And caches of stone blocks and tool blanks or preforms have been unearthed in the watershed here and in the Ipswich River watershed, as well as on Cape Ann. 
Here are some examples of preforms that were cut out from uh, mind blocks of stone. And these were found in a cache near Chimaco Lake. You can see the locations where future spear point is going to be here. And this is going to be a future axe that's been roughed out. And then the stones were abandoned. So that's a, what they call a preform in archaeology. Rocks were split by hammering the wedges into the cracks or into lines that were picked into the stone. And stone could also be gouged from boulders using fire, especially effective for splitting granite and ground stone like basalt and whatever. Um, which does not flake um, on a line of fracture, but sort of spalls off uh, conically um, or conchoidally rather than on a plane. So on granite and ground stone, percussion pecking was the principal method. And these are some examples of stoneworking tools here, quarry tools. Uh, not shown as a, a pick, I have a picture of one, a quarry pick. So they included anvils, chisels, wedges, hammer stones, and a braiding or grinding stones for finishing the work. The other two abundant rock and mineral resources in the Parker River watershed are igneous rocks, such as granite and basalt, of course, and glacial marine clays. The native people quarried pegmatites on Caban, and all along Route 93, for example, um, Dascom Road in Andover has a lot of pegmatites. These are granite boulders with very large crystals of minerals, including gemstones. The Native Americans would pry out these <coughs> minerals and pry out the gemstones and polish them for other uses or use them for other things. Um, they were carried for magical protection or traded inland. The people inland were in areas that had sedimentary rock. To them, it was very special to receive anything from the igneous rocks that we have in this, this area here with all the crystals and uh, gemstones and minerals and so on. Yes, and the hardness, sandstone being very soft. Um, so um, significant deposits of the glacial marine clays are in all the waterways all along routes 1 and 1A here and in the salt marshes just to the south, and then there's some major deposits down in Danvers. So there are pockets of, uh, you know, very deep deposits of glacial marine clays and other areas where it's more, more shallow. There's a lot of clay here in your, in your river. So the people use that clay for their pots. So these are, uh, this is in the background shows uh, a pegmatitic rock with lots of minerals included in this rock are garnet, feldspar, and mica, all of which would be greatly prized. This is basalt with olivine crystals. This is an example of an olivine crystal that's been taken out and polished. Um, this rock, which happens to be in Lane's Cove in um, Caban, has been mined by Native Americans. All the crystals have been dug out of this rock, very old rock. And nearby, there is a boulder with petroglyphs, which is practically now overgrown with seaweed. So this was a major uh, mining area. The shaman's uh, medicine kit included anything special or small or shiny or magnetic or unusual. They were used in healing and div divination, especially quartz crystals, citrine, olivine, mica, malachite, Amethyst, garnet, pyrite, and galena, all of which are gotten here. These are paint stones at the bottom. The one on the left is tergite, um, which, is, which makes a uh, yellow or orange pigment. And this is uh, hematite. And they've been a hold for portability. So you would carry your paint stone with you. Paint was needed for all kinds of things. Um, and um, what you would do would be to grind some of it off uh, at, into, uh, onto a stone, for example, a flat stone, powder it even further, and then you would add animal fat or vegetable oil to it to make a pigment. 
um, or you might use kaolinite for a binder, uh, and you would mix, mix them and apply them. Paint stones are very common here. Uh, for green, we have glauconite, um, and kaolinite, and calcite for white, and limonite, which makes a, a dark, a very dark reddish brown. The native people use the uh, glacial marine clays, a variety of colors in their pottery. I don't know if you've ever been to Martha's Vineyard um, at Gay Head, where there's uh, all the different colors of clay. That occurs here also, and there's a great variety of clay in here in the banks of the of the rivers. The clay was tempered with fiber, shell, ground quartz, mica, sand, or the crumble of broken pots. They were convex in shape to be propped among rocks or nestled in the sand, and the size and thickness of a pot made it better for certain uses. For example, pots for cooking without water and for storing dried foods were thinner and more porous than the pots used for boiling, especially boiling quantities of uh, vegetables. The people also made clay cylinder beads and effigies. This small eared vessel at the bottom, um, which is only about four or five centimeters long, uh, was a, is, a, is a, uh, a black bear head effigy. It would have been used as a votive with a pitch of tobacco put in it, and then the vessel would have been put in a niche in the rocks or under a tree or wherever it was that whatever spirit it was that was being propitiated. Um, this uh, particular piece is currently on display at the Cape Ann Museum. They have an exhibit called Gloucester Before 1900. Um, uh, and they have an event on April 21st. Uh, they're having the Hassan at Nipmuc chief, whose name is Cheryl Tony, uh, who is going to come to talk. And I'm going to come to, the two of us are supposed to have a dialogue. This is going to be very interesting, because I'm not sure what we're going to talk about. but. Uh, so we'll, we'll be giving that, and that's uh, at 3 o'clock, I think, on the 21st at the Cape Ann Museum. And you can see this and some other artifacts. The Algonquians made pots the same way that we learned in camp. Uh, they kneaded the clay into a long roll and then coiled the roll around to make the shape of a pot. And then they would pinch the coils together while building up the sides. They used various tools, uh, thumbnail scrapers and engravers, to smooth and shape the inside of the pot and to mark the exterior. The use of a quartz tool imparted extra spiritual power to the pot. The artisans also wrapped paddles with fabric or cord to texture the exterior while they whacked the wet pot into shape, and they used sticks or fingernails or stone inscribers to incise designs. The designs were rows of dots, uh, horizontal and vertical lines, and zigzags. Those were the most common motifs. Uh, pots often were decorated only around the rim. And these examples are from Essex and Ipswich. The finished pots were first air dried in the sun and then baked in a fire. They would put the pots on large flat stones in pits and then stack wood around the pots and then set the wood afire. The pottery would bake uh, reddish because that method exposes the clay to air. Um, and so uh, that's different if you fire clay in a closed oven, it's more likely to burn black in the absence of oxygen as opposed to open air, which makes it uh, more in the presence of oxygen. So, and wood-fired pots were more fragile than oven-baked pots because uh, they were fired at lower temperatures. And I think that's the main reason that the Algonquians did not discover metallurgy. Um, they didn't have blast furnaces. They didn't get their fires hot enough. Some pots called uh, punctate in the lingo, uh, and these are from Ipswich and Hog Island. They were made with holes near the rims to suspend them over the fire or to aid in moving them on and off the fire by inserting sticks into the handles on the sides to lift the pots. Uh, the people had other uses for clay, and they had other ways of cooking. 
They baked cakes on fire-heated flat rocks, and they steamed corn and shellfish in the sand at sand banks. The colonial people also used the local clays in their pottery. Newburyport was famous during the colonial period for its lead-glazed redware, for example. Uh, and it was the only alternative at the time to expensive ceramics that were imported from, um, from Europe. This uh, compares local stone with imported stone. Native lithic materials found here or in Essex County are mostly made of local stone with earlier imports that archaeologists regard as diagnostic. For example, the archaic people brought jasper from New Hampshire. They brought uh, Munsungan and Rama chert from Maine. And the woodland people brought Onondaga chert from the Great Lakes region. And chert, which is uh, flint is a form of chert, is the most convenient stone for napping and for projectile points because of the way it fractures on a plane and the long-lasting sharpness of its edges. The local stones were very challenging. I mean, anybody that has tried to work granite <laughs> knows that uh, granite and basalt are difficult. So after percussion flaking or pecking, a piece could be further reduced, reduced through grinding and polishing, um, like this smooth, perforated silt in the local gabbro that's on the left there, the black stone. Um, again, it would have been carried, which is a portable thing. Um, the kind of stone that flakes on a plane, like chert or like the volcanic glass, <coughs> like obsidian, um, the piece could be further refined through pressure flaking. And in pressure flaking, you have thinned sides, which are then punched uh, to make a sharp edge, um, a cutting edge. Pressure flaking was accomplished using small punches made of wood, bone, ivory, or antler. It, it's similar to stepping on a, 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 a shallow ledge of ice that's melted underneath and it crunches down. It's a similar effect when you use the pressure flaking method on, on the right stone. These projectile points um, from the woodland period, uh, from different collections, the ones at the top are all quartz, except for one, I think it's one calcite crystal, because quartz was, was rarely uh, completely transparent. The triangles at the bottom are felsite, and the tiny jasper point, the red one, which is barely two centimeters long, was a bird point. Um, it was used uh, for birds to avoid damaging the feathers, which were very important to the people for their ceremonies and to wear. Uh, in fact, they usually used nets or bolas for birds for that reason. This uh, fully grooved tool has a hammer on one side and a well-worn axe head on the other. It's from Ipswich. And it was made through a process of percussion, pecking, grinding, and polishing. Uh, so uh, it's like uh, carving the statue of David in marble, where you have to chip, chip, chip away, and polish, 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 till you get what you want, bit by bit. Tools that were not handheld were hafted, uh, attached to wood, bone, or antler handles. Uh, those things tend to disintegrate in our acid soil, so the archaeologists tend to find the, the stone part, but not the wood, bone, or antler that was used to heft it. Uh, so um, methods of hafting using fibers uh, were as diverse as the tools themselves. These are just a few examples, and there's the, the quarry pick that I mentioned earlier. Stone beads of malachite and lapis are mixed with glass and ceramic beads in, in, these, uh, in this bracelet at the bottom. These, uh, the jewelry was taken from burials in uh, Ipswich, which is, doesn't happen anymore since the passage of NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And we no longer rob graves or, or collect bones and so on. Um, this was, these were found off, uh, this one was found off Argila Road. This one was found in Anasquam. 
This, this one from Anasquam is trade beads. Uh, so it was a contact period uh, burial. And these beads were made between 1622 and 1628 in Jamestown. So uh, the archaeologists use uh, beads to date, and help to date a site. It's possible. These pieces are in Harvard's Peabody Museum of, in Cambridge. This is a, a Minnesota pipestone, uh, a broken pipe. It was a ceremonial pipe, uh, not used for recreational smoking. Um, it's, and it's in uh, the Anasquam Historical Society. This sculpture, which is made of sandstone, was found in Lobster Cove in Anasquam. It's three-dimensional. It's a woman, and she has an infant on the nape of her neck held on with a tump line. Um, it's about 20 centimeters. The woman's headdress uh, reveals her ethnic identity, and presumably that of her sculptor, as Micmac or Maliseet from Nova Scotia or New Brunswick. Now, the Micmac were enemies of the Pawtucket, and they may have occupied Lobster Cove after the, uh, the Abnaki-speaking uh, Pawtucket left, um, because for at least five or six hundred years, the uh, Micmac and Maliseet had raided all the villages along the New England coast for corn um, and coveted those uh, seaside sites. These are native petroglyphs. Some are hard to see. This is a, a row of triangular shapes. It's the symbol of a village. The number of shapes would identify the number of teepees, or wigwams, rather. They're teepee-shaped, but in the village. And here's the seaweed growing over them. They're barely visible anymore because they're totally submerged at high tide and have been for hundreds of years. It's amazing that we can see them at all. And then you have things like a triangle in the top of this rock. This is at Pole Hill in Gloucester. Triangle is an Algonquian symbol of healing. This would have been a place of healing of some kind. Uh, it, there are lots of these that uh, remain to be discovered. And, and I have not had an opportunity to explore your rocks here. I've been all over King Band's rocks. These are examples of uh, horned serpents. They're carved into, oops, they're carved into granite boulders on uh, Pole Hill. And that hill is um, discovered to have been an astronomical observatory and ceremonial landscape created around 2,500 years ago. <coughs> and study there is still ongoing. Um, the rocks, the sight lines have been identified for the solstices and the equinox um, and uh, other sites, sight lines are being established for other astronomical events. Here's a bear claw and hand in Asquan. But And now I, I really can't get around anymore in the, in the rocks. I'm afraid I'll kill myself. <laughs> so it's just too bad, but I keep hoping that other people will see these things and get excited about ex examining rocks more closely when they're taking walks in the woods. Um, I focused on stone because the Stone Age people who lived here were experts in stone. But you know, bone, antler, and ivory were also very important materials in art and in tool making. And this is a display from the Phillips Collection of the Cape Ann Museum. There's an awl, a tool handle, knife blades, hollow bird bones, which were used as uh, pipettes or drill casings, fragments of compound fish spears and fish hooks, and the ankle bones of deer, which were probably used as drill sockets in the fire making process. As a medium, animal parts are is even more versatile than stone. Now, these detachable harpoon, harpoon tips from Gloucester were for killing harbor seals, grampuses, which was a North Atlantic porpoise, swordfish, and giant sea bass, all of whose bones are found in sites there. Uh, the broken harpoon fragment on the left, which is in Manchester, is calcined or burned antler. 
And the tubes on the right, uh, which came from Wingersheek, I believe, are the hollow leg bones of a large wading bird, such as a heron. If they were blocked at one end and capped at the other, they made very good containers for small quantities of special substances. Tobacco or medicinal powders, blood, little stones. And Shemin also used them as straws in various curing processes. You could blow through the straws to have an effect. You could also suck illness or evil spirits out of things through the saw, straws and so on. So we find those in sites with uh, shaman's equipment. The ready-made fish hook is the nasal bone of a deer. All parts of the deer or the moose were repurposed. Leg bones for handles, hooves for rattles, bladders for canteens horns for clam forks, and nothing was ever wasted out of respect as well as out of the need to uh, have a subsistence economy. The bones and teeth in a site like these aid in the reconstruction of the people's prey animals, their diet, and their seasonal occupancy. Teeth and claws were also used in jewelry and in inscribing or engraving tools in decorating property, uh, pottery. Here's an antler comb, a bear claw necklace, wristbands or bow guards uh, made of antler, and beaver tooth charms. Shell was also important for diverse uses. The Lake Woodland Indians uh, limed their corn hills with broken shells to sweeten the soil a bit. Uh, and also it was used to, shell was used to stabilize sandy soil. Uh, the New England coast was covered with clam middens or shell heaps and the types of shells that are diagnostic of the time of occupancy or the date of occupancy. Um, for example, um, sites with large proportions of oysters and surf clams uh, are uh, uh, earlier than uh, sites that have soft shell clams, for example. The people harvested clams or preserved the meats through drying or fermentation. They stored them to eat during the winter or they carried them back to trade inland. They were delicacies to the inland people. Seafood was a major trading good, dried seafood. Uh, they gathered pearls from oysters and mussels, and pearls were also greatly prized, as you might imagine. The depths of accumulation of shell refuse uh, from harvests and meals can aid in calculating uh, the population or the length of occupation of an area. This one is on Great Neck in Ipswich. And you have a shell midden by the side of the road here that was pointed out to me, uh, right here on your uh, turnpike and you probably have a great many others. There are undoubtedly many more shell heaps here on your, on your reserve. The people used the shells and bony tails of horseshoe crabs as tools, which was observed by the French explorer Samuel de Champlain, and they added the uh, bodies of horseshoe crabs to their corn hills or used them as fishing bait. The shell was easily carved. It had many uses. They could be sewn together to make purses or canteens to carry provisions. Um, you could have, you could attach them to your belt uh, for tra for going on the trail. You could store in them tobacco or first aid uh, material, parched corn, and so on. The Algonquians also made surf clam shells into trowels with handles that they used for weeding their gardens. Our, our horseshoe crabs are pretty, almost nearly extinct here. I think they still come up into your sound, the Plum Island Sound, they still come in. They used to come in, when I was a kid, they would come into Front Beach in Rockport. We would go down and look at them, but they're, they're dwindling. This is the one on most range. Is that right? <laughs> Um, caches of sea snails and uh, whelks have been found in sites uh, all around here. These are from the Wingersheet Beach area. 
and the shiny interiors of the shells, the nacre, was fashioned into jewelry and sewn into clothing. Nacre shells have uh, been also been found as grave goods. An important use of shell was the production of wampum, wampum beads, and our barrier beaches were a source of these shells to make wampum, uh, and the shells were also traded inland. Uh, the things that we call periwinkles, are dog whelks, and they actually were used to make individual white or gray wampum beads. Uh, the Atlantic whelks, channeled whelks and knobbed whelks and so on, uh, you could make several beads out of one core of the, of the uh, shell of the animal. Um, between 1637 and 1652, wampum was legal tender here for both colonists and Indians. And uh, the, this is where the shell began to have a monetary value rather than simply a symbolic or cultural value. The Native Americans used wampum in all kinds of contexts, uh, uh, but uh, the um, colonists commodified them into currency. So, uh, and there was a lot of internal competition to have a monopoly on the uh, access to the shell and trade with the beads. Um, and the English started to make their own. In fact, there were even factories in Belgium and Holland that made wampum beads and then exported them back out to America in order to... Uh, eventually, the Native Americans just turned up their nose at all wampum because it just wasn't, wasn't the same, it wasn't real. Mercantile. Uh, economy. So they were made by drilling the spines of the shells using an awl or a, a fire drill type of thing with an anvil stone. And then once the hole was made, then the uh, beads were cut and polished. And um, the, the uh, blue and purple wampum beads were made from cohog shells uh, which was much more difficult to make and therefore more valuable. In 1640, a penny would buy six white beads for three blue ones. A fathom of wampum was standardized as a string of 360 beads worth five shillings or 60 pence, and a fathom of blue beads was worth twice as much. You could pay your taxes in wampum in, wampum in the colonies. You could also buy a house with wampum, and you could pay your tuition at Harvard College with wampum. Combinations of colors made geometric or symbolic or representational patterns as strings of wampum beads were sewn together into belts. Belts could tell a story or recount <coughs> kinship or history, or they could send a message of intent, such as war, peace, friendship, alliance, unity, disunity, and so on. The hatchet belt at the top, for example, was a declaration of war. Somebody would deliver that to your village and that was an announcement that you were about to be attacked. Um, this uh, this uh, wampum belt has a figure, a human figure, with the symbol of uh, peace. One hand has the symbol of peace, and the other is holding a bow, which is uh, a symbol of alliance and warfare. And you can often date uh, wampum belts by the content of the design. Belts with crosses and steeples are always post-contact. For the Algonquians, wampum belts represented honor and prestige initially, and not wealth. Uh, they were exchanged at weddings, naming ceremonies, adoptions, initiation rites, treaty signings, trade agreements, and funerals. And like the stone beads, shell beads were soon replaced with European glass trade beads. Wood and fibers are natural materials found here in great quantity. They carved bowls and spoons and made many other kinds of objects out of wood. Uh, they used burls, roots, and bark. And they also wove plant fibers into baskets, mats, cordage, nets, and fabrics. These spoons and bowls are made from uh, burls, from maple, ash, and elm trees. 
Wood and fibers were the stuff of wigwams. As these uh, historical photos suggest, their homes were circular bark or mat covered, wooden frames in various <clears throat> shapes and styles. They were often intended as temporary or seasonal housing. Wigwams were left standing for anyone to occupy when the family wasn't there until uh, the family or hunting party that built it returned. Raw materials and preserved foodstuffs were often cached nearby to use in future occupancy. And a family might build two or three wigwams in different places to use at different times. They might have a house in their winter village, the permanent uh, village, they might have a summer camp, and they might have a, uh, a winter hunting camp someplace. They had a systematic method of engineering wigwams. First was setting out the frame, which was based on the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, and then divided up the same way you would divide a pizza if you wanted equal portions throughout. The next step was to set up pairs of poles uh, at uh, the cardinal points, and then these were drawn together at, top, at the top and tied. Then you took the other uh, in-between air pairs and did likewise with them, put those together. This left a sort of uh, square opening at the top for your smoke hole. Then you added your layers of bark. This bark was used for, for winter, usually three tiers, sometimes four tiers, starting at the bottom and then building up. And then, because of our wind, which we get sometimes, you wrapped uh, Portage or saplings around in an uh, overlapping crisscross fashion. Wigwam interiors, walls, floors, seats, sleeping platforms, and beds were made with woven mats. The mats were corn husks and cattail leaves. They were actually pretty comfy. These heart shaped palm tools were women's weaving aids. Uh, in the construction of mats and bedding, the notched end could be used to straighten or smooth fibers, and the pointed end was used to push fibers into the weave. Um, and the woman could rotate the tool in her palm uh, without having to stop work as needed. Brushes, bulrushes, sedge, stinging nettle, dog bane or Indian hemp, and milkweed stalks were the best sources of uh, bast. Fast is the inner fiber for making thread and string uh, that can be woven into fabric or cordage or, or nets. Bast from uh, dog bane stalks could be rolled on the thigh to make a, uh, a string or spun uh, on a spindle whorl to make thread. Uh, rolls and bundles of plant fibers were cached for the next season along with the dried foodstuffs and the tool blanks. Baskets were woven using sweet grass, uh, as well as uh, beach grass and eel grass, and also splints from the underbark uh, bark of several types of trees, especially elm and uh, ash. <coughs> you probably have seen coiled sweet gra grass baskets, which is still being woven. Other tools for working fibers were uh, notched stones, for combing and straightening fibers. And this perforated schist here has a smaller diameter on one side than on the other, and it was used to uh, de-chaff a stalk or debark a branch to pull, you pull it through. <coughs> and the sinew stone at the bottom was used to separate sinews for stretching and drying for use as uh, thread and sewing hides. And it could also be used to separate plant fibers for fine weaving. Evidence of woven fabrics comes from Samuel de Champlain's drawings of the Algonquians he saw on the North Atlantic coast. Here's a, a warrior, a Sacco warrior, uh, wearing basketry armor. Here are ladies wearing uh, woven uh, skirts, and I believe these are shells or pearls that are strung, that are hanging. And these are examples of two types of weave that they used in making their mats and their garments. 
Champlain also sketched this mess, interesting method of basket weaving. It's hanging from a tree and she's uh, weaving it upside down, which I suppose for a very large basket that would be a very handy way to do it. There's also a basket backpack, a sheaf of uh, arrow shafts, a, a, a mat for sitting on, and an, a, an indoor uh, water bucket it was kept inside. Wood and fibers were also used to weave crab pots and fish weirs. And you may have an Algonquian basket that has been passed on in your family. And these are in the Penobscot uh, Museum on Indian Island in Maine. Objects such as canoes, show snowshoes, sleds, and cradle boards combined wood and fiber crafts. This is a uh, modified Algonquian design for a canoe. Uh, and this tiny model came, uh, that came from Anasquam is more like the style that was made here. It's decorated with quill work uh, and was probably made during the contact period. This is a, a decorated um, papoose carrier, cradle board. Um, it's decorated bark or, or carved bark that is, has been uh, sewn onto an ash frame. It would have had a, uh, it would have had eel skin ties and it would have had uh, backpack straps and also a protective wooden band above the baby's head. And little mobiles or a dream catcher would have been attached to the band. And uh, the cradle board would have been filled or stuffed with disposable cattail fluff or diapering material. The people made dugouts. Uh, the Wampanoag called them machoon. Um, we are at the southern ex uh, extent of the canoe, uh, birch bark canoe culture. If you go any further south, it's only uh, dugout canoes and not birch bark canoes. So we're really at the southern extreme. Um, but the people also made dugouts, and they were made from tree trunks. I think it's only a matter of time before we find one uh, buried somewhere in an Essex County salt marsh or in a pond. Um, the colonists appropriated them for use as hay ricks for salt marsh hay. You may have historical photos with um, Michoud carrying great huge stacks of salt marsh hay on them. Um, and they would also hosey certain trees uh, for private use to be made into dugout trees. And the Algonquians did the same thing. Certain tree, birch bark trees would be identified as canoe trees. And nobody was allowed to cut them down. They were to be grown to become canoes. They felled and gouged trees using fire, the aid of fire, um, both to fell the tree and to um, gouge it out, a process described by early explorers. You just uh, set fire to the tree and scrape it out, um, extinguish the fire, scrape all the char out, and then set fire to it again until you have the shape uh, that you want and it's been hollowed out enough. Deerskin and moose hide and the fur of fox, beaver, marten, otter, muskrat, squirrel, rabbit, bear, were the stuff of winter wear and social status. Trapping, curing hides, and sewing clothes with needle and thread were year-round activities for both men and women. But the women did uh, the dirty work of uh, fixing the hides, curing the hides, and they used these steep-sided palm tools, uh, which are from Ipswich, as scrapers and rubbing tools for finishing the insides of deer, deer skins to be made into clothing. This woman and her baby are in traditional dress, uh, but contact period deerskin clothing appropriated European tailoring styles with collars and front openings. More traditional clothing featured yokes and raglan sleeves. Clothing and accessories were decorated with feathers, teeth, dyed quills, embroidery, plant and mineral paints, shells, pearls and beads. And different treatments uh, distinguished garments for ceremonial use, or for weddings, or for hunting expeditions, or for war parties. And clothes did not always make the man, however. Uh, men traditionally went more or less naked for dirty jobs or for bloody ones. 
and often went into battle naked. A Jesuit missionary drew this illustration in the 18th century of an Abenaki couple all dressed up there on their way to a wedding. Their clothes show the traditional peaked hoods and the use of fabric dyes and embroidery with traditional motifs. Uh, the blue is from blue wild indigo, which is native to eastern North America. And in this child's toy, which is a toy papoose, the doll's little head is carved out of a walnut. These are contact period uh, northeastern Algonquian quillwork uh, box, a quillwork box, those are porcupine quills. Uh, here's beaded moccasins. And these are patches of embroidery in the style that was used here in Essex County. Traditional Algonquian motifs were based on shapes and features in the environment, curving trail lines, hills, wigwam domes, palisaded villages, uh, berries or rock clusters, circles and dots, sprays of foliage, abstract forms such as uh, contrasting diagonal lines and so on. These motifs were combined and repeated in patterns and they were used everywhere in painting, ornamenting, beading, embroidering, weaving, basketry. Medallions and flowers with stems and leaves were also traditional motifs. And the beadwork in these examples is so fine that you don't even recognize that there are beads there. It looks like embroidery thread. Those are all little beads. Uh, the the uh, people became so adept at using the glass trade beads that they came to be called Indian beads. This is uh, Gladys Tantaquidgen and her brother, and there's Gladys as an old woman. They were Mohegans from uh, Connecticut, and she died in 2005 at the age of 108. And the picture of her as an elderly woman features traditional Algonquian design motifs in her clothing and her jewelry. She was a famous speaker. And so beginning with stone, these are the materials that the ancient artisans used to furnish and embellish their lives. Their sites and their artifacts and remains and their memory of their very long history here and their living descendants that are here today are an important part of our heritage and the heritage of the rest of uh, Essex County. So, and I, I've started publishing my book, Long Promised, but I'm finally doing it. It's on a WordPress site. I only have two chapters up so far in the preface. The site is called kbanhistory.org. I have 30 chapters all together, and it goes from the last ice age to around 1750, and the history of Cape Ann. Essex County. So thank you. I think I came in just under an hour. Oh, 
over to your, <laughs> to your wooden thing or your clay thing. Yes? On your site, is there any organizations that are trying to keep um, track a lot of teaching ones? There are a lot of native groups that are doing this. Does it, can anybody be part of that or is it part of their particular There would be opportunities, and to find out about them, I would suggest contacting the Massachusetts Center for Native American Awareness. Uh, they know um, about uh, people who are Native people who are interested in giving demonstrations or lectures, or who are dancers or singers who can perform uh, that are willing to come. Uh, and she may know; they would know courses or events. They're they're. Not, they're widespread and growing in number because now uh, everybody has started to realize that really they were Indians here. They did not all die out or kill each other off. They were here, and uh, you know, and they're still here. They're here today. So there's a lot, a lot of interest and growing interest in their crafts. During the forty years, what would be the migration pattern for a typical village like this? Do they come to the coast in the summertime? Do they go inland for better? I mean, do they go up to the falls when the salmon were coming in? Was it, uh, well, the people who came to Cape Ann, I can speak to. Okay. Uh, they wintered in Ramisic, which is Lowell. Yeah. And in the spring, they would come down to Pawtucket Falls for the alewives. Yeah. Then, or the river herring, and then they would come to the coast and to their summer camps. Okay. And they would plant, okay. plant corn in both places. Mm -hmm. They didn't move en masse. There were always people in all the different places. Oh. It wasn't a mass movement. <coughs> uh, people, families did individual things, um, depending on where their interests lay. There were always some people in the winter village year round okay. who didn't travel, who didn't take the trip. Women had Babies, old people, people, the ones who were doing the planting, people who didn't feel so good, people who were going visiting uh, a country to the sea dollars, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yes. Just like our lives. Absolutely. <laughs> Just as complicated. Um, so, uh, and then um, uh, it, at the end of the summer season, some groups would go to winter camps somewhere else up in the woods to hunt or trap. Others would go back to the winter village. And some would uh, go on trading expeditions to trade inland uh, or up the coast. So okay. I think the people in Quasquequiquen, um, <laughs> up in the hill, uh, that was that would have been a permanent year-round village. And it has it happens to sit on some of the uh, very small amount of good arable soil that we have in this area. And they they would have planted there before leaving. They're closer to the shore here, so they would have stayed long enough to plant there. Then they would have come down to their camps. They had camps all along Plum Island itself, on all of the little islands and on all the on the you know, on the beach side and so yeah. all up and down. <coughs> I love the shellfish. Oh yeah. It's yeah. Well, and when you think of it, uh, shellfish is high quality. Anybody can dig it. You can be, you know, you can have arthritis and still get it. You know, you can be a child and still dig a plant. Yep. So. And that nutritionally, it was great to take in them too. You know, yep. the iodine and yep. things that other people might not be getting. Anymore. That's right. They had, they were very well off the people who lived here. Mm. They had an excellent diet and they were comparatively rich, much richer than the particular gathering peoples to the north. Until the Europeans came and coveted their furs. Yep. Then the people in the north brought guns before anybody else and you know made you know, made, made a problem for the agriculturists to the south. They had it they uh, they had uh, various sobs and potions. There were there are complaints in the literature about insect bites. I don't know if it was greenheads or mosquitoes, but Oh, right. Yeah. Nasty. They had all kinds of uh, all kinds of plants that they used medicinally for skin ailments, skin protection. Mariella, I have a question for you. One of your earlier slides you had the owl and pieces. Yes. Um, how old were those? Uh, owls would probably be late archaic, 
so I would say maybe 6,000 years ago. Were, were they found uh, Bull Brook, or was that? Well, Alba reeds are all over. Yeah. Some have been found in Newbury, Newbury Gorge, as well as in uh, Ipswich and uh, Cape Ann. You once told me that you actually, did you make one and we were, were I testing did, it out? I did. I, I was curious and I made an atlatl and I went out to practice spear throwing with an atlatl. I didn't have a weight on them. But are you referring to the time I did this in some field by the side of the highway and then turned around and discovered that all this traffic had stopped? <laughs> <laughs>